How did I know the lyrics? Well, I never even heard the song before. But you have heard it before. And if you remembered the song, maybe you remember us now. Well, I certainly hope that Courage does remember the Bugaloos because our guest tonight on the show is John Philpot, who played the part of Courage on the Bugaloos back in uh, the early 70s, the fabulous Sid and Marty Croft children's television show that aired on Saturday mornings. And uh, John has been very, very active in music over these past couple of years, but he's been gracious enough to take a few moments out to uh, chat with us about uh, his work with Wayne and Caroline and Big John on the Bugaloos. And I should mention that uh, there's Big John and Little John because there were two Johns on the show. So John Philpot is affectionately referred to in the fan community as Little John. Uh, John, welcome to the show. And uh, as I understand it, the Bugaloos, very much like the Monkees, were comprised of two members who had more of an acting background and two members who had more of a musical background. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. It, it was a great, great partnership. And I'm not sure whether it was by design, but probably it was. But both Caroline and Wayne were very good, strong actors. And John, Big John and I were quite strong musicians, you know. We were the ones that could play and sing, and the other two could act and sing. You know, we helped each other through. You've got to bear in mind, we're all very young. And um, it was a little bit overawing at times. And, um, you know, with scripts and that, with, well, how do I say this? How do I say that? And, of course, we bounce it off of, uh, off of Wayne or Caroline. And, of course, on the musical side, it was... Um, they do the same to us, you know. Well, how do I sing this? Shall I sing this like that or so on? And, you know, we just bounced off each other. And I think it, it really worked. And, and, of course, it gelled so quickly. We all had so much in common that we wanted this thing badly and we wanted it to work. We wanted to do it really professionally and because it, it was a career. Well, can you tell us anything about the audition process? Well, it was a long, long, long time ago, Dave, but... Um, Obviously, it's something that's buried in my heart, and I really have some fond memories of that audition. Um, at the time, I was, I was acting, I was in singing, I was in a group, and, you know, I was really having a, a really great time. And um, I just saw an article in, in the national paper called The Sketch, and it wasn't anything too large, but it, it, it had, like, a photograph, an editorial about two Hollywood producers coming to London to look for talented youngsters to form a musical group called the Bugaloos. And um, they said it was the brainchild of Sid Croft, one of the very successful Croft brothers of Sid and Marty Croft Productions. Mm. And uh, the auditions were to be held in my building in London. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd not been to London that much. I certainly had been to AMI, so it was a little bit sort of... Um, you know, I was a bit sort of scared, I suppose, in one respect, you know, quite <laughs> nervous about it all. But something was just driving me on to do this. It just felt right. I had to do this. So I sent a half a dozen photographs taken off a very cheap camera <laughs> and, a, 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 and a brief resume. And when I say brief, it's not like the CV you would expect to see today. It was literally a handwritten page. And it just very, very loosely outlined what I was doing, and I sent it off, and I didn't think, to be honest with you, I'd hear any more about it, but um, strangely enough, I had this telegram from the cross, and it came back on my 21st birthday, and um, it was such a, such a surprise, and it just said, please phone Sid and Marty Croft, EMI, London, urgently. And so that was my, you know, in to the audition, so to speak. And, of course, by that time, you know, the auditions were nearing their end. So, you know, I didn't know that until I got there. So it was quite lucky that, you know, I'd sent these, these photographs in. So they got some idea what I looked like and what I'd done. So, um, and, and that was it, really. But, you know, you can imagine, you know, me going to London and, going to EMI House in Lancaster Square in London and, and then having this huge audition. I, there was like 4,000 people there, so I was told. Right. And it was really huge, you know. And I remember 
at my audition, um, we were we were sat in a, a semicircle, and I w- I was happened to be with twenty other hopefuls, and um, Sid Croft was sat in front of us, and I think I was about number fifteen in our twenty. And, you know, when it came to my turn, I just spoke about my theatre work and my musical ability. And then at the end of my five minutes, I made a joke at the end, and which everyone in the room laughed at, to my surprise. <laughs> and to my further surprise, Sid Croft was laughing, and he actually stood up, bowed his head, and clapped his hands. So I felt really great. <laughs> well, what actually happened then, um, I was asked to leave all my details at reception, and they would contact me. Of course, I just went home on the train, and that was the end of it. But then um, they did phone me and asked me to go back to London as soon as possible. I didn't have to audition as such again, but I was invited by the cross to stay in London at the Dorchester Hotel, uh, where over dinner I was introduced to the late Lionel Barr. And as you know, he was the writer of the musical Oliver. Sure. Starring Jack Wilde. And, you know, we all got on house, you know, like a house on fire. It was really, really good. It was a wonderful dinner. And I was told over dinner that I had the part and that I should prepare myself to move to London and meet the other buglers at Barbara Speaks Stage School. And they were to prepare us for our lucky break. <laughs> <laughs> I was sworn to secrecy until, you know, we all met up. And it was at this stage school that uh, the four of you, I guess, did rehearsals for the show or exercises? I think really it was the main thing to see whether we could get on. Of course, we were doing um, audition pieces then. We were singing and we were singing as a group. Um, we were acting, acting as a group. And, and you know, it was all designed to get us working together to focus on this lucky break that we've got, this massive break, and, and to go to America. Had you been to the States before? No, I mean, um, you know, I hadn't been very far at all, really, before. I was 21. Um, I'd been to France, and they, I'd been to the North, because we had family in the North. But apart from that, you know, uh, it was a big, big step for me. And But I have to say that what made everything so much easier for me personally was that John, Wayne, and Caroline, they were just wonderful, wonderful people, and we thought, this is it. You know, we get on well, we're going to do well, we sing well. And we couldn't wait, really, to get the plane out to, to America. Fly away with us into space and far beyond. Fly away with us into space and far beyond. We're talking to John Philpott, who played the part of Courage on The Bugaloos today. And in speaking with Caroline and Big John, it seems like the weather in Los Angeles made quite an impression on uh, the Bugaloos. Let me tell you, we've got a maritime climate here. It's it's, uh, warm and wet. Ah. I think your climate over there is very hot and dry. Right. So the minute we got off of the plane, it just hit us, you know, the heat. Right. And it was wonderful. It made us feel so healthy. Um, so we've come from this really, you know, over uh, overcast, um, you know, England, coming to this wonderful place, and it was daylight, and it was warm, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful feeling. As we stepped off the plane, Sid and Marty Croft were there at the top of the steps to welcome us off, and, and of course, it all started from there. And you step right from the paradise of Los Angeles into the psychedelic paradise of uh, Tranquility Forest, that great set. It was psychedelic, and, um, well, yes and no, it wasn't psychedelic, literally, but it it was just the whole design, the whole colourful thing of it. You know, these these truly whimsical sets, they took over two uh, large lots in Paramount Studios, and I believe it was number 19 and number 21 studios that we had, and half was staged in one and half was staged in the other. And they were designed by James Tritipo. And what a wonderful guy and his imagination. You know, he built these two large sets. It was just absolutely breathtaking and dreamy when we saw, 
you know, right before our very eyes that that was going to be our home throughout the duration of the filming. And do you know, the very first time we all went there, it just felt like home just already. Huh. And, and when I was shown my uh, home, which was this very, very large plant, Obviously, it's all set and it's all right. painted, absolutely beautifully painted. Um, uh, I lived in this large uh, cane type of, of building and, um, or plant, and um, I had this door, which was about 10 feet above the ground. <laughs> and that's where I had to come out and do my, well, the first bugaloo line in the whole series. Right. Was, um, you know, rise and shine, wakey, wakey. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm thinking, my God, how do I get up there? It's, it's amazing. And, and, but, you know, this is the cleverness of, of Hollywood. You know, there were three guys behind um, the set, and they will elevate you up to the right level. And then, of course, outside of that door, there was this ledge which I had to stand on. It was only about a foot wide, and two foot in front of that was this huge pole that went up and the idea was for me to come down and slide down this pole as I'm saying my open line. A little bit like Batman, you sliding down that pole in the be- in the first episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a bit of a clumsy Batman. I think it was, uh, it was very strange because the idea was for me to grab the pole with my right hand and put my right leg on this little step, and the pole would be lowered down, and of course it would swivel at the same time. So. Yeah, well, you know, I think I got away with it. It was as, <laughs> as dangerous as they could possibly make it, I think, really. I'd like to get your impressions of Benita Bazaar and Sparky, respectively, Martha Ray and uh, Billy Barty. Uh, yeah. Martha Ray, she was, she was an absolute gem. You know, I, I remember when we first met her, she was just so natural and she was so warm and friendly. You know, I mean, she's this big, big star, and but she was so natural, and you know, she just made us feel very comfortable. And even though she was this great star, you know, she was never that big to embrace us newcomers into this 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 show. You know, yeah. And and she was just a wonderful woman, and we 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 sort of got to know her quite well off set as well, and. We went out for a few meals and returned the favour, so to speak. But she was just a very funny, funny lady. And with Billy Barty, um, I've got such a, you know, a soft spot for him in my heart. He was such a wonderful guy. He was my famous big little guy, as I used to call him. <laughs> and um, because he, he was a drummer as well. He, he could drum and he could, really could drum. He was excellent. And during the filming, he had a kit of drums um, that was at the back of the set in one of the lots. And him and I just used to just go off between shoots and breaks and one thing and another, and, and we'd just go and play his kit of drums. And it was one of the smallest kit of drums I've ever played on. <laughs> and I think at that time, it was probably one of the smallest professional drum kits in the world. And, you know, we just bounce off each other. He'd show me some licks and I'd show him some licks and you know, we would spend hours and I have to say, we did get into trouble a couple of times because one, we were missed and two, we were making too much noise. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you were going to be making music as well, had you ever been in a recording studio up to that point? Um, only a couple of times um, and it was just to do demo stuff where you would send off to the majors and so on but Nothing really, not to the extent um, and the size and professionalism of what we were offered in the, you know, with the Bugaloos. Was the album recorded over a long period of time, or did they group a bunch of sessions together really quickly? Well, I mean, we were filming, you see, during the day, and it was quite long hours. And um, the only time that we could record... Um, was in the evenings, and of course, the musical director, Hal Yergler, he was such a lovely guy, he was so laid back, so friendly, and everything seemed to work, oh, don't worry, we'll do that then, we'll fit this in there, we'll do that here, and and we were quite tired, but going to the studios uh, in the evenings, it 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 was brilliant, it just 
picked us all up and we were just raring to go and it's you know we just felt fresh and able to to cope with it all but i have to say that there were times when we didn't have to go as a group all the time caroline might just go and put her lead vocal or double double sing that and, right and then maybe um wayne and i would go along and do harmonies and john would do harmonies some of those songs on that album were, 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 were near genius in the way that you know the arrangements and the lyric and the you know it's truly whimsical some of them if you listen to the sound we're talking to john philpot who played the part of courage on the bugaloos and well not only were you uh, making the music but you were also uh, a fan of the music it sounds well i mean i always felt comfortable with everything that was given us we just needed to go along and perform and hopefully perform it you know, to the best of our abilities and, and, and make it acceptable to those people that actually wrote that song. And, of course, make it marketable, you know? Right. Now, I know that you... But I have to say that, hmm. you know, on reflection, you know, there, there may have been an area where maybe we thought, well, you know, there are no love songs. Right. Why can't we have a love song? And, you know, why don't we write a love song? And I think that would have come had we'd returned... You know, right. we, we were talking more about, as a group, going out and doing more live performances rather than more PR and live, to, you know, to do a tour and do live show. And obviously then we could have more of an input then and, and um, um, perhaps maybe feel that um, we'd have more of an input that way. In fact, that's something I've always wanted to ask about. Did the Bugaloos ever perform... As, as a group, live. Yes, we, I, I can recall it was a really odd occasion. We didn't, do, we didn't do very much live singing as a band, but a lot, we did a lot of um, studio work. I mean, when we were doing radio shows, they would play the, the tracks, but we weren't sort of uh, lip syncing or anything like that. We were sort of just doing an interview, and they'd be playing the track. And, um, but, um, you know, when we did... Um, America Bandstand, I mean, that in itself was truly amazing. You know, that's probably the, probably the best pop show that America's got. Right. And we were part of that for four or five minutes. And we weren't singing live. We were actually, um, although we were singing, it was going out as, as the record. Right. And I can remember that afterwards, uh, I can't remember the host on there, was it? Um, Dick Clark. Dick, someone, Dick, Dick Clark. Clark, yeah. He came to us and said, oh, that was great. Because I think at first it was a bit tongue-in-cheek, four English guys coming here with wings and antennae and <laughs> what's going on, you know, what's all this about? And, and I think the way they obviously, you know, shot this, this uh, four-minute sequence, you know, Dick said that was fantastic, lads, well done. And, and I think he meant Caroline as well. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And from what I understand, that promotional tour was uh, pretty lengthy. You covered a chunk of the country there. We did um, 13 states, I believe, in 30 days. Wow. And that is quite a lot of traveling across a very, very big country. It was tiring again, but, I mean, I suppose it was a plane flight every other day, virtually. And um, it's... It took a lot out of us, but it was just so exciting. You know, we're different. We're a different stage. You know, we. It was just such a wonderful experience. And meeting the fans, I can remember, it was just absolutely wonderful. Just seeing their faces light up when they, when they see the bug, bugaloos, and they're there in front of them. You know, they could touch us and they could ask their autographs. And we'd sign all their autographs and everything. You know, and. It was just wonderful, and that happened on many, many occasions. And, um, of course, it was just a great honor to be there and to be part of all of that success because, you know, the fans that turned out to come and meet us, you know, that was a great indication of the, you know, the success of the shows. I just wish that we'd done more of that. Well, it was right around this part of the conversation that the phone went dead. For some reason, uh, John and I were disconnected. I'm blaming this one again on Benita Bazaar, much like 
when we had the Caroline Ellis interview and the radio station went off the air mysteriously that night. I'm blaming that on Benita Bazaar. But what this little break here gives me the opportunity to do is mention something that John sent in an email after uh, the interview. He said one of the things he wanted to talk about with regard to this uh, trip across America, uh, that the Bugaloos went to Dallas and uh, they also met the Beatles, but also, and I'm just going to quote him here, arriving at our hotel in San Francisco, driven through 500 leery protesters shouting and chanting whilst waving their many banners. Bit scary, and then the mood was lifted and became a lighter moment as we left the hotel one hour later to do more PR in full bugaloo costumes. We were greeted with cheers. We found out later that the president of Vietnam was staying at the same hotel. Peace, man. Oh, I'd hate to think that people were protesting the bugaloos arriving. Anyway, we're going to go back to uh, the interview. I wound up having to call uh, John again and continuing our conversation. And uh, here's the rest of that interview. Uh, We were talking about the end of the Bugaloos when we were disconnected and how uh, you were sent home to uh, England. Um, Well, we had options. We didn't have to come home. I think the Crofts were quite happy. Bear in mind, you know, the shows had gone out. They were finished. They were now being screened coast to coast on NBC Network. The music was done. The album was out on sale. The single was out. So it was job done to that point. It's like, where do we go now? And, of course... We were told that uh, there was a film in the offering with Columbia Pictures. Right. And that wouldn't be until 1971. And and then there was talk of releasing another album and and possibly, you know, another tour. And and so there was so much more in the pipeline. And I think, you know, we've been away from home since June 1970. And this is around about December time, 1970, and it was just, we just felt that, you know, we've, we've done the best we could. We've done all the hard work. We just need to have a break. It'd be great to catch up with our families and then come back out to, to America. But then, you know, time went on and time went on and, and nothing really concrete happened. We had phone calls from America saying you come back, and, but, you know, there's not a lot happening. And then we heard about Columbia collapsing and all that, so the film... Um, you know, it was, really wasn't on, and it's all a bit iffy. And I think what we did want to do, we wanted to go back. We, you know, the shows were, were running and running and running, and they were being repeated and repeated. And, of course, you know, the, the success was getting much more. And, and, of course, and that was in our absence, you know. Right. And we were part of that success. So coming home was, was great, but, you know, I, I think... In retrospect, you know, it was a missed opportunity. And, and I, I just think that all four of us missed that opportunity. And, and really, I think we probably all regret that we didn't go back. But, you know, we just waited around for the call. And I, I'm not blaming the cross for one minute, but it was just obviously things weren't happening. I, I think maybe the show was good, but maybe uh, they felt it could be better. I, I don't know about the music. We didn't get a number one hit song. We, well, I think we hot, we hit the top 100 or something with the with the um, the song for a friend. Right. And maybe just maybe they thought, well, you know, shall we pick this up? Shall we not pick it up? And we weren't part of any of those decisions. And and so you know, at the end of the day, you know, we could only sit here for so long. Um, just waiting for the phone to ring. And um, so we, we just gradually, we, we were in touch with each other, you know, we were talking, and we just felt, well, we've got opportunities open to us, we're going to do this, I'm just going to do that. And basically, um, that's what we did. But, you know, all the while we were in, at home in England, and now we're talking maybe a year on, two years on, five years on, the shows were just being repeated and repeated, you know, and that we were getting residual through, so we knew that they were being repeated on, you know, many, many stations. And, of course, it was going worldwide by then. It was in Australia, Japan, you know, you name all these places, and it was there. And Australia, I believe, for a friend got to number one in there. You know, it was was quite successful. So all this was happening, and we had no part of it. And again, you know, we're thinking, well, you know, oh, hang on, you know, we've done all this work, <laughs> we've done all this promotion, 
And this thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're no longer a part of it. And, and uh, it just got to the point where we felt collectively that there was probably no more mileage in it, that we weren't going to get a phone call. And, um, and so time just went on, went on, and we all literally drifted away. We were still in touch with other, but we just went away on our own, you know, little plans and stayed in music, stayed in acting, and, and we did other things. But you you continued on in, in music, and you, you've had... Have you had a series of bands or just one band after? Uh, the uh, well, mainly two bands. Um, one was sort of like recording musical type stuff. I mean, I do write. And the other was uh, my bread and butter, really. It was a cabaret show band. And uh, basically it was sketches. And, um, you know, although I was a musician at heart, I love performing, and, and my act, and I love to act and perform. And, you know, that's one thing that I, I do owe a lot to the cross. Uh, I, I went into that show as a musician and came out, or morphed, <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. into a performer, <laughs> into an actor-singer. I love it, you know. So, and, you know, it, it spurred me on, and, you know, it's been my life ever since. And basically, um, getting more to the point was that this show was an hour show, and it was just completely cabaret from start to finish. And I wrote sketches, and I would dress up in like I dress up as Tina Turner, and we'd do a Tina Turner sketch with the music, <laughs> and it, but it's comedy taking on the audience, sure. audience participation, Freddie Mercury, and and just doing things like that, the sketches that were written and using their music, and, and just having a comedy influence with it to, um, you know, to involve the audience from, from, the, from the start. So you know, having that ability you know, has, has been brought out more in, in the, the bands that I've done recently than I did maybe when I was a bugaloo. You know. Dave, can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so how old were you when you watched the bugaloos? And... And so what attracted you to it? Well, I'll tell you, it was one of the very first shows that I remember watching. I remember watching two shows, The Bugaloos and Petticoat Junction, when right. I was about maybe two. I'm that, I'll be that honest with you. I was about two years old, which is really almost kind of a perfect age for that show if you're just getting into, uh, you know, you're just you're watching television. It's a very colorful show. Yes. You know, there's plenty of, uh, you know, plenty of things to uh, get your imagination going. So, and I remember, now I, I was probably watching it, you know, it's probably two years after it had wrapped and it was uh, in right, reruns. Yeah. yeah. And right. I had said this to Caroline that I must have been watching the same episodes over and over again, but never knew it. You know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And but the thing is, you see, when you do watch stuff over and over, you, you see things you missed the first, second, third time anyway. So... There's always something you can pick up on, but um, you know it's 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 just uncanny that something so great has been shelved. Yeah, we had so much more to offer. You know, we could sing, we could sing together. We were good. You know, we felt we had something to offer, and you know, and I think personally, and I, I'm saying this personally, I think the shows, I think the music, as as good as it was 40 years ago. It still sounds good and fresh. I agree. And I'll ask you what I asked the other Bugaloos. If there was a possibility of doing something together again, do you think uh, you'd be up for it? I feel that Caroline, Wayne, John and I would truly love to just go and do this thing in whatever format it takes, just really to, to go and meet the fan base. If it wasn't for, you know, I suppose the fan site and, you know, fans or people like yourself that's quite willing and openly talk about the Bugaloos, you know, it just, it just brings back all those memories, you know? And, you know, when you think that... Um, do, you, do you know Bill Ung at all? Have you oh, heard yeah. of Bill Ung? Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've talked to him, sure. Oh, well, I mean, you know, we're all indebted to Bill. I mean, you know, it... <laughs> He was a brainchild, and of course he's the webmaster of the Bugaloos fan site. 
Right. And, you know, we owe so much to him for keeping this dream alive and to all the beautiful fans in Tranquility Forest. And, you know, I urge, I urge your listeners, if, if, if they just want to spend a little bit of time relaxing, enjoying, and just have a bit of fun, you know, you know to, to really log on to the website, you know, it's www.bugaloos.com. And, you know, we'd love to speak to you there. Come and join us. And I can't believe that I'm actually talking to a DJ from New Jersey where Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons came from. <laughs> Absolutely. That is truly amazing. I love Frankie Valley. <laughs> yeah. There's no other voice like it. Absolutely unique. Well, that sounds like a cue if I've uh, ever heard one. Thanks so much, John, for being on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for ringing me and bringing me back. That was great. And <laughs> I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch. There ain't no good in our goodbye.